So when I was asked to talk about this topic, I actually got really excited because there's so many things over the years that are kind of best practices and um, the issues that I'd like to highlight. Um, so for those of you that I don't know or don't know very well, um, I wanted to remind you of my background so you get a sense of where I'm coming from. I've worked in clinical and health services research for over 18 years now and um, just recently hit the 100 publication mark, which I was very excited about. Um, and then when I look at all of the co-authors that I've worked with over the years, there were some real um, standouts in these interdisciplinary teams. So not only physicians, um, residents, nurses, the, uh, technicians, but also psychologists and engineers, human factors, social sciences. So that's one of the things I love about the services research. There's so many different dimensions and it truly is an interdisciplinary field. I've worked in diverse settings, including academic medical centers, large uh, academic community hospital, and then a small contracting firm where we worked on a huge project, the World Trade Center Health Program for uh, first responders um, of the 9-11 attacks. So um, all of these things I'm gonna talk about today cut across all of these settings, all of these themes. Um, of course, the common themes for success, you might not be surprised to hear, are good communication, mutual respect, and valuing teamwork. If we all just recognize the value of it and actually make efforts toward improving teamwork, that'll go a long way. So the, the background setting that we're all working in, this is not going to be surprising to anyone, um, very busy schedules, your, your clinical responsibilities, the emergency procedures that you have little to no control over, um, and then multiple projects. So the clinician investigators may be juggling multiple projects along with your clinical work. And keep in mind that your biostatistician is almost always juggling multiple projects as well. So time management is one of our biggest challenges. There are also communication differences across the board. We've got uh, visual learners, people who like to talk through things to learn it. Now we've got Zoom and face-to-face -face meetings and, and other options as well. We have generational differences, certainly. And then there's um, oftentimes a steep hierarchical gradient that we all just need to keep in mind. You wanna optimize teamwork, uh, doing your best to, to flatten the hierarchy, so to speak. Um, can go a long way toward your team members feeling comfortable sharing information with you or, or maybe even uh, disagreeing with you on, on methodology. All right. So I always like to start with a study. There are a lot out there, and this one I found actually published pretty recently, um, to show how biostatisticians contribute to teams and what are the outcomes that, that you can improve if you have a biostatistician on your team. So this study actually focused on reporting quality because there are so many quantifiable, standardized reporting checklists out there now. So they took advantage of this and um, compared studies, randomized, observational, and prediction studies. And they looked at those that had a biostatistician as a co-author uh, versus those that had no biostatistician as a as a co-author and found um, significant improvements in reporting quality in two of the three subgroups. And you can see that the randomized studies effect was actually the largest, but um, had really wide confidence intervals. So you can expect better reporting, but also biostatisticians can help in so many other ways. They can help improve the study design, even if this is just through conversations, discussion, brainstorming, can help you think through uh, better ways to, to implement the study. Obviously, they can help improve the analyses. But I think the dissemination is really where uh, the bang for your buck comes in, um, in helping with graphs and tables and putting together the information in a, a nice package for publication that makes all the difference. Reporting accuracy we talked about. Um, the responses to reviewers is something that I find myself more and more involved in over time, even as I uh, maybe step back and, and let other frontline analysts do the work. Uh, the responses to reviewers is when we can all come together and make contributions to, um, these were our decisions, these are our justifications, here are some descriptive data that may explain why 
We don't need to worry about multicollinearity in this regression model. Um, so, so definitely incorporate your biostatisticians in your responses to reviewers and, and let them help you with those pieces. So the topics I wanna to talk about today are um, sort of before the meeting happens, how can you prepare what to, to be ready for when you first meet with your biostatistician? The analytic plan, which I think of as, as more of the quantitative piece, we'll talk a bit about uh, variables, measures, analyses, um, but nothing too deep on any of those. And then the more qualitative piece about communication and teamwork, how do we best share information? How do we deal with authorship? And what are some common communication mishaps? Okay, so let's talk preparation. Uh, this was another really great article that I found published recently, uh, focused on the topic of working well with your biostatistician. So I've borrowed a few things from this lead publication, and I, I encourage everyone to, to read it. Their first figure is this um, sort of a schematic of the different research phases and what are the contributions from the clinician investigator on the top and the biostatistician along the bottom. So you can see that in the planning phase, there's formulating the research question and the study design and applying for funding. Those are led by the clinician investigator. Um, identifying the appropriate analytic strategy and drafting the statistical methods should be led by the biostatistician. And then these things are, are iterative. They feed into each other and you may go through a few cycles during the planning phase before you, you really finalize it. In the analytic phase, um, I would say make the first draft of the analytic plan yourself as a clinician investigator. Obviously, the biostatistician will add to that, and so this could be another part of the um, iterations. They listed data management as a clinician investigator responsibility. I'd say the first few steps, like obtaining the data, data use agreements, certainly that's uh, investigator-led. But then, of course, there are pieces of the data management and specifically cleaning the data for the analysis that the biostatistician is going to need. And I would encourage everyone to not forget about the data management and cleaning steps. That's something that's easy to gloss over. And you may think that, 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 oh, that sounds pretty easy. And we just have a few variables that we're using. But this is always more time consuming and complicated than you think it's going to be. So, so plan accordingly. And then in the reporting phase, as we talked about a bit ago, the clinician investigator can start with the first draft, uh, writing and revising the manuscripts, maybe creating table shells or drawing out figures that you'd like to see. Um, but really with the new, newer stat software and the newer journal requirements that uh, figures come straight from the stat software and don't have any uh, you know, editing and PowerPoint where you add text boxes and things like that, it's becoming more efficient and really makes more sense for the statistician to, to take over the figures. So talk about these things from the beginning and, and make a plan as to who's going to take lead responsibility for which piece. Okay, so these are some questions that your biostatistician will ask you and you can be prepared for them for your first meeting. Obviously, your research question is the first, uh, foremost, and everything comes from your research question. So that's where you're going to start. We'll talk a bit about um, a, a way to a framework to do that in a minute. So the study design is very important. Is it observational? Is it randomized? What data sets? Uh, what variables? What are our outcome and predictors? Repeated measures is something that may not seem important, but it's very important to the analyses. So if you know that you have repeated measures over time, uh, give your biostatistician a heads up about that. The effect you expect to observe, um, we may call this the effect size. Uh, you may hear reference to the minimum clinically important difference. So I would encourage you to think about both of these things. The MCID is something that, that you want to have in mind. It may not be exactly equivalent to the expect size, the effect size that you expect to observe, uh, but you can use these pieces of information for the power calculation. Other variables that may affect your results, these are confounders. Also importantly, exclusions. There may be some patients that are just not appropriate to analyze for this research question. 
In a prospective study, you want to be thinking about how many patients you can realistically enroll, how many, um, how many procedures do you and your, your practice do a year um, that are going to meet these particular inclusion criteria. Also, your consent and your follow-up completion rates may be really important for your, your prospective trial. And then for grants, we talk a lot about preliminary data. So um, especially if you're going to, going to ask for a power calculation, you need a starting point. So, um, so bring in some preliminary data or have some ideas about where you might find that from the literature. If you don't have your own pilot data. Okay, so this is a bit more about the research question, um, the PCOT question. I, I learned this as PICO, but there's a T on it now for, for timing. So I um, thought that was an important update because time is everything. Um, so your P is your patient population. Who are you studying? What is the, the condition or disease, um, certain demographics, certain settings? Uh, all of those things define your, your cohort, patient population. Then you have an intervention. This could also be a, a procedure, a policy, a process, a treatment, uh, whatever you're studying. Comparison group, very, very important and sometimes left off of, of surgery research. So important to think about who's the appropriate control. The outcome is O. This is sort of your effect of the cause and effect. And then the T, like I said, is time frame. So this can have to do with your actual years of your study. If our study time period goes from 2008 to 2014, um, repeated measures can come in in time, and how long it actually takes to experience the outcome of interest. So from the, the person's standpoint, what is their time frame uh, versus the study time frame? So if you have answers to all of these things, then you can put together a pretty complete research question. And then your hypothesis naturally flows from that, and, and you're on your way to study design. So the other thing I would recommend doing before you meet with your biostatistician is drawing a DAG. So this could be very simple. It could be crude in the beginning, and you use this as a way to um, have the discussion, your biostatistician, to bring out some other variables of interest or unmeasured confounders that, that may need to be represented here. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about DAGs. I did want to include a few slides of how you would put them together, but um, I have a much more detailed DAG talk that I'm happy to send you if you want more details here. Uh, but basically, you start out with your, your cause and effect, your uh, intervention, and your outcome. And you draw an arrow between them and indicate the question mark for this is the research question we are testing. Second step is to con consider other variables that are in the research question. So if you have a moderator or a mediator in the research question, such as how do surgical history and opioid usage relationships differ by gender? So gender in that case would be your moderator. There is some disagreement about how to notate moderators in DAGs, so I'm not going to get into all of that, but just know that you may see them different ways. Uh, similarly, mediators um, would go in if you've got that as part of your research question. Um, so a mediator is in the causal pathway. So in this case, the, the intervention um, acts on the outcome in part through the mediator. So that would, again, need to be part of your research question if that's what you're trying to test. And then finally, you add the confounders. These are other variables that, that need to be taken into account. They can cause both the treatment and the outcome, for instance. So that's all I'm going to talk about for DAGs. You just know that you need to have all of those variables in there, common causes of any two variables in the DAG unmeasured and even unmeasurable common causes should really go in as well. Okay, so I just wanna summarize quickly this first section. These are some things that you should probably do before you ever have your first meeting with your biostatistician. Um, anybody have questions, thoughts or comments about those? All right, you're all pros. 
<laughs> helpful for, to send it to you ahead of time for perusal? How much time do you guys yes, have? Yes, please. <laughs> please send it all ahead of time. Um, I always ask for that. It, it feels a little bit like I'm, I'm putting a lot of pressure on you to, to get it to me for homework or something. So I understand in, uh, it's not possible in all cases, but if you can possibly do that, it's a huge help. Um, you know, most statisticians are detail oriented, so it makes us good at our jobs. So we can go through all those details and absorb a lot of that information before the meeting and be 10 steps ahead. So highly recommend it. Okay, right, let's get into the analytic plan. Um, so the first thing you're gonna to wanna to be thinking about, you've got your DAG drawn out. Um, you want to think about what types of measurements you're going to make. Are these continuous variables where you have you know, all of the numbers on the scale are possible? Are these categories where there is no particular order or is there an order like uh, PGY level is one of my, my favorite ordered categories. Um, and then down at the bottom with the, the lowest information content, are binary variables, and that's because there's only two categories. However, we use binary variables a lot in health services research. Um, and in fact, we can often, we'll take a continuous variable and dichotomize it into a binary variable, which may seem counterintuitive because we're losing all this information. But um, in cases like this, where there's a clear clinical guideline and either you're above it or you're below it, it makes a lot of sense to look at the information that way, dichotomously, instead of trying to use the entire scale. But depending on what your research question is, we can talk through what's appropriate um, for your analysis. Which statistical tests to use? So this is um, very stressful for a lot of people. Um, so I would say, don't worry about this. Let your biostatistician worry about this. They can help you write your, your analytic plan with the exact specific tests that you're gonna need. Um, but I would say keep in mind the four things on the left. These are the, the things that um, determine which tests are going to be appropriate. So the number of independent variables that you have, the number of predictor variables, the measurement scale they're measured on, whether you have independent groups versus matched groups. Matched groups might be a pre and post, for example, in the same setting. Um, and then the measurement scale of the dependent variables. So if we're doing um, a regression model, it's the, the dependent variable is really going to drive what regression model we're going to choose. So don't memorize those. <laughs> so these are just some typical types of, I will say, traditional regression models. There are so many different flavors and options with machine learning and, and all the things out there now. Um, but this is, these are the ones that we most commonly go to. Um, I, I added this relative risk uh, group this year. So um, log binomial and modified Poisson regressions, we're seeing more and more of those because presenting the results as a relative risk is, tends to be preferred over an odds ratio because I think we all conceptualize risk a little bit easier than odds. So consider doing that for your models. If, you're able to, and they make the results that much more interpretable and meaningful for your audience. Of course, I had to mention the mixed effects models. We use these frequently. If you have nested data, say patients within surgeons, within hospitals, um, this is something you should be thinking about. These are very flexible and have a lot of benefits for things like handling missing data and non-uniform measures and they're available for different types of outcomes. So um, be familiar with those as well. Okay, imputation. I've noticed this is um, a common topic of conversation lately. So there is a really good paper by Jacobson that I have in my um, reference list that anybody who's interested in multiple imputation, I would highly recommend it. It's, it's very, um, logical and there's even a flow chart that you can use to determine if, if MI is appropriate for you. But basically, if you have um, very little missing or a lot of missing, that's less than 5% or greater than about 40%, or 
or if you have certain types of missing data mechanisms, like if you believe the data are missing completely at random or not at random, and those have specific meanings, we could say. Or if you're missing only the outcome measure, if any of these are true, then multiple imputation might not be appropriate. So um, there was a lot of excitement about multiple imputation. And then I think we started realizing where it could be used and where it wasn't really that much of a benefit. So now these guideposts are out there to help you think through whether this is something that, that you should do. If you can't use multiple imputation, the recommendations of this paper were to, um, to use your observed data, but obviously discuss the limitations. That should be a big part of your discussion section. If you've got missing data, what you think the, the mechanisms, the drivers, and the impact on your uh, results. You can also consider best worst and worst best case sensitivity analyses to assess the impact of the missingness on results. And I'll show you a quick example of that in a second. But either way, I would say you want to discuss this with your biostatistician early. If you're thinking about imputation at all for missingness, this is something that has to be incorporated in the analysis, in the planning from the very beginning. So just quickly, I wanted to show you what best worst and worst best case uh, sensitivity analysis might look like. So if you had um, if you had complete data on this 75% and 25% are missing in group A, you know, similar 25% missing in group B, your best worst case analysis would impute the harmful factor or the outcome for the missing in one group and a beneficial factor or outcome in the other group. If you have a dichotomous variable, that's easy. It's zero in one group and one in the other. If you have a continuous variable, it might be the mean minus two standard deviations in one group and plus two standard deviations in the other. So there are ways you can do this with, with different variable types. So you would set it up this way in your best worst. You would set it up the opposite way in your worst best calculate the result of both of those, and the range of those results tells you what is the potential impact of missing this. If you get basically the same result on both ends, if, you're, if the range does not give qualitatively contradicting results, then that's another reason to think you can ignore the missingness, because even if it's at, at either extreme, you get the same interpretation of your results. So something to consider if you can't impute, this, this could be helpful. Of course, I have to talk about the p-value. Um, there's so many emotions wrapped up in the p-value and so many um, in increasing numbers of rules about it. So I'm actually glad to see that journals are taking this on. Um, as a reminder, the p-value is the probability of finding the observed result or a more extreme result if the null hypothesis were actually true. And the null hypothesis being there's truly no difference between these groups. So statisticians, you probably noticed, have strong feelings about p-values. It is easy to abuse p-values. And if you go looking, you'll find hundreds, if not thousands of papers um, about this. Confidence intervals are gaining momentum to, to actually replace p-values. So some journals will tell you they don't want to see your p-values, only confidence intervals. Um, I took some examples from the big journals. Uh, JAMA has guidelines to avoid solely reporting the p-value. You have to also uh, report the descriptive statistics or the, um, the probabilities of, of your result. Uh, New England Journal says similarly that significant tests should be accompanied by CIs and measures of association or other parameters of interest. And then uh, BMJ notes that p-values are not preferable to CIs, but if desired, they have to be reported with all these other things. And do not report non-significant if the actual p-value. So um, there's a lot of ways to, to potentially run afoul of these guidelines. And if you try to stick with confidence intervals, you're going to you know, probably be on pretty solid ground. So again, a couple of things to keep in mind. Statistical significance does not explain the magnitude of the effect. You can have a very large effect and still a non-significant p-value. You can have 
a very small effect and a statistically significant p-value, but it may be completely meaningless clinically. So that's the second point that statistical significance is not the same as clinical significance. So that's another reason you want to keep the minimum clinically important difference in mind. And then you always want to talk about the clinical implications of your effect size in your paper. P-values, we should keep in mind, represent a continuum. They're not truly a binary yes-no. 0.05 was, was sort of an arbitrary um, initial cut point. I really love this quote. I'm sure God loves the 0.06 nearly as much as the 0.05. <laughs> Um, so, so report the actual numbers, don't dichotomize it unless you have to, and keep in mind that p-values are highly dependent on sample size. So it is possible to over-interpret your statistically significant p-value, or you might be tempted to under-interpret a non-significant p-value when if you just had a bit more of a sample, that would be statistically significant. Ever, do you think that they will exempt the confidence intervals from the word count in abstracts? I would love it. How nice would that be? Yeah. I would do that all the time, but it's so many more characters to yeah, put into a very short abstract yeah. Yeah. So yeah. do the right thing. Yeah. And I end up putting p values that I don't want to no, because I no can't get the information point. anymore. Well, if you put no spaces within the brackets that the, I tend to do, it just counts as one word, you know? <laughs> no, <laughs> no spaces. It doesn't look pretty, but it's just comma. Yeah, exactly. I know, exactly. <laughs> yeah, seriously, we, we shouldn't have to be out here trying to game the system in order to get all the relevant information in there. Um, so, yeah, good, good luck with that. If, if there's a petition I can sign, please let me know. Okay, so we'll talk a couple of slides about power and sample size, keeping in mind that HSR is very complex. We're often looking at multiple outcome measures. We have observational designs, uh, maybe some cross-sectional. We're taking preliminary data from multiple sources, all of them imperfect, and we're trying to put this together for some uh, convincing power estimate. But this is a very important part of planning the research. So your power estimates will shape your study design and your data collection processes, but also the process of putting this together really tests the validity of the study and help you confirm your research questions and clarify your outcome. So, um, so it's not just a game to show the reviewers that, that they should give you the funding. There really is some value in going through all of this and perfecting your power estimates. You can use Cohen's D if you have a, a continuous outcome, although um, I don't think that these are very interpretable. They're out there, but um, there may be better ways to do it, like the minimum clinically important difference. Um, so I, I put this slide together thinking, if your biostatistician asks you for your effect size, where do you start? <laughs> you know, so, so Cohen's D may be a place to start to say, Okay, well, if we powered our study to find a medium effect size, you know, what would that power be? Um, but then you want to think more deeply. You know, what really are the expected values uh, per group? What is the minimum uh, clinically important difference? For example, would a 10% change in this outcome, would that potentially lead a clinician to change his or her practice uh, to incorporate this new intervention? Um, and then the inverse relationship with sample size is, is a little bit counterintuitive. So um, keep in mind that as you increase your effect size, you will decrease your sample size. If you are looking for a larger, more obvious, very clear effect, you don't need as many people to, to actually show that huge difference. If what you're trying to show is a relatively small difference, you're gonna need a much larger study to, to power that, to find it. So lots of components of power calculations. These do vary by study type, um, but these are the things that you wanna to try to put together. If you're, if you're gonna need a power calculation, going for a grant, you will need a power calculation. Um, I find it interesting though, that this is often where we start. Like the, the first time I meet an investigator, we start talking about power. <laughs> It'll be the first thing that we jump into. 
And it's one of the hardest things that we're going to do. So uh, don't be too hard on yourself. You know, take it one one step at a time, one bite at a time. Um, and be patient with your biostatistician who is not the clinical expert that you are. So we're going to have to ask a lot of questions. They may be dumb questions. Um, just try to understand how these things all fit together. What is the cause of picture? Okay, so my overall tips are to seek biostatistician feedback early. There's a trend there. Um, calculations take time and typically a few iterations. So it's not just a, a one-time calculation and here's your sample size. You often have to go through it and think about feasibility and other considerations. Uh, if you don't have any pilot data, then it's helpful to identify a previous research study, even you know, something from the literature, and use the minimum clinically important difference. You want to calculate your power before the study is implemented. In most cases, with an asterisk, uh, post hoc power calculations have limited utility. We're doing some. We're, we're working on them now. Um, but, but generally, you want to have this all planned out before uh, implementing the study. And then as the study is going along, you might want to um, you know, do some brief checks to make sure that, that your power is where you thought it was. Um, but honestly, you know, things are designed and set in motion and, and already moving at that point. Mm, my favorite. So also, um, if you report your power as just one number, and you're 80% power to detect this effect size, and you end there, it doesn't really give you a sense of, of how sensitive your power calculation is to other parameters. So I would always recommend, if you have time, calculating a couple of different ways. So you might calculate your power at, um, say, 80, 85, and 90%, for example, to see how much that changes your, your end. Um, you might calculate your power for different effect sizes because you're not really sure if it's going to be an odds ratio 0.08 or 0.8 or, or 0.9. You know, so, so that probably has a big impact on your power. So look at it with a couple of different assumptions and conditions to get a sense of that. All right. Any questions about the analytic piece? Okay, so thinking about communication methods, we have so many options for this these days. Um, we're setting up project folders on Box, and that works for a lot of teams. <clears throat> the Box can get really overwhelming, and so if your statistician is you know, juggling a lot of projects, they may ask you to take it off of Box and deal with it in another setting because finding things on box can be challenging. But it works really great for some people. Um, are you going to use shared Google Docs or are you going to email word attachments back and forth? People have strong preferences about that. Um, Slack is a newer uh, available communication option. I have seen that more of our PIs are using it um, and it has advantages but also has its challenges. So these are one of those uh, you know, across generations, across roles, across different types of learners, everybody just needs to come together and say, this is how we're going to do it uh, for this project. And it may not please everybody, but as long as you know what the plan is, then you can be consistent and, and stick to it. <clears throat> for ongoing questions, um, should your statistician email you or send you a Slack message, or do you really prefer text messages? Not so great for people outside the clinical environment. I just say, um, but you know, if you talked about it ahead of time and you know that everybody's okay with text messages, then then that may be fine. So I encourage you to just have open conversations about the pros and cons of each of these methods, and don't get too far out there. Like if you've never used Slack before, don't say, okay, this is how we're going to do all of our team communication. Use things that you're familiar. Okay, so this was another thing I got from the Lee paper. I appreciated that they did sort of both sides of these common pitfalls. Um, so I think these are these are great uh, illustrating examples. 
Now, one example of common pitfall on the investigator side is not asking for clarification when it's needed, not asking questions. Um, so it's really important to understand your analyses and all of the, you know, may seem like mumbo jumbo that your biostatistician is telling you, um, but really important for you to ask questions and understand those. Um, biostatistician on their side may present results that are difficult to understand. They're just completely opaque and they're not making an effort to make sure that you're understanding what they're talking about. Um, so, so there are ways that this can go wrong on both sides. On to the next ones, uh, investigator asking the statistician to rerun analyses to obtain statistically significant p-values. Please, please, please don't do this. Um, I think for those of us that have been in these situations, it's really painful um, because as a statistician, it makes you feel like all of your efforts have just gone down the drain. Like, what am I doing? This is not what I'm here for. I'm not p-hacking. I really want to try to do a good job on this analysis. So um, don't look for statistically significant values where we're all just trying to get the, the accurate you know, answers to the research question. Um, another thing sort of unrelated on the biostatistician side for this one, if they're unfamiliar with clinical criteria, they can incorrectly assign categories. They may randomly choose um, cutoffs based on a, a continuous scale. Um, a lot of times without any a priori knowledge, we might take a continuous variable and put it into quartiles just to, to see what happens with, with different levels of the variable, which is fine. But if there are actual cutoffs that make more sense clinically, we should be using those. Okay, next one for investigator, unrealistic expectations of time required or demands something to be done immediately. Um, there's room for things to have immediate, you know, rapid turnaround, obviously, but if, if you're the person that's always demanding immediate attention, that's not sustainable and can be really stressful for, for your statistician. So again, recognizing that, that they're juggling multiple projects. Um, on the biostatistician side, rushing through analyses to meet a quick deadline is very problematic, almost always leads to errors and um, not recommended. Um, on the topic of errors, investigators should recognize that errors are a normal part of the process. And these happen in healthcare, they happen in, in data analyses, and um, we want the biostatistician to feel comfortable admitting when there was a programming error going to occur. So we need to have open, honest, and understanding communication to share that info. And then finally, um, not making efforts to flatten the hierarchical gradient. So that the, the members of the team, not just the statistician, but the but the students and, and other people on the team, everyone should feel comfortable speaking up and if they see something that doesn't seem quite right. And the, if the biostatistician doesn't speak up when the proposed methods are inappropriate for the data for the research question, that could lead to major problems. So good communication is key. All right, I wanted to do a quick run through of the ICMJE authorship rules. I think we're all probably using these now. This is a core Aspire um, set of rules that we've adopted for, for our authorship. So all authors must have made a substantial contribution to the conception or design of the work or acquisition analysis or interpretation of data. And need to have contributed to drafting the work or revising it critically and have final approval of the version to be published. And finally, agree to be accountable for all aspects of the work. And in this case, for the statistician, that may be accountability for the analysis and specific aspects of the work that, that they control. But all authors must have all of these pieces and if you have an author that's made a substantial contribution for number one, then we really should be giving them the opportunity to do two, three, and four as well. Not like you can just cut somebody out because they didn't do all of these. We're all supposed to be making efforts to, um, to have the full team contribute. So typically, um, 
biostatisticians will have made a substantial contribution to the analysis in all the cases. Generally on authorship discussions, um, I read this paper by Alexander, it's, it's quite a few years old, but it had some really good tips in it that, I, that just keep coming up over and over. Talk early and often, make a plan about authorship early, and then tweak it as needed as the project goes along. The situations may change. Um, and then authors, like I said a minute ago, should be included in the other phase. They've met criteria number one, um, allow them to participate in the other phase. When conflicts arise, you can look for win-win opportunities. There are usually people on the team who are really wanting, really gunning for those higher level authorship roles. Those should be the people that get the, the extra work, <laughs> you know, the writing, uh, making the tables and figures look nice, reviewing the process of submitting is getting more time consuming and complicated every time you do it. So those folks that are really looking to, to rise up in author order can take on more responsibility. Um, and then obviously don't let a small matter ruin a good relationship. Working relationships go on for years. It's a very small world, so don't burn bridges over silly things like authorship. All right, so those were all of my points. I'll give you my quick takeaway summary. Plan ahead, talk early and often. Share your mental model, also resources, papers, everything you have. Send them to us before the meeting if you can, that's better. Allow time for the iterative processes in all research phases. So um, I really think that research is better when it has time to kind of bake in, let you sit with it and think about it and sleep on it for many nights, have multiple conversations. Flatten the hierarchical gradients to optimize teamwork where possible. And always ask and encourage questions. Many, many references. I highlighted the three that I think are most interesting for folks to read. And I'm happy to have any questions or if you've got some tips or recommendations for what works on your research teams, I'd love to hear them.